This lesson is for FST Lesson 3.8 on inverses. Inverses should be an idea that students have seen before, but just to remind, to find an inverse, all you have to do is switch X and Y. I would encourage students to say that to themselves in their heads several times throughout the video. To find an inverse, you switch X and Y. Keep in mind that since you're switching X and Y around, the domain and the range will also switch. So if you're asked questions about the domain and the range, hopefully you can uh, accommodate that with your switching of X and Y. There are three different types of problems that I want to look at with students. The first one is looking at finding the inverse of coordinates or points, then finding the inverse of equations or functions, and then finally finding inverses of graphs. So let's look at coordinates first, or points. And remember that to find the inverse of a bunch of coordinates, you simply switch x and y around. So the first coordinate becomes 2, 1, second coordinate 4, 3, third coordinate 6, 5. No real magic or trickery going on there, it's simply a new list of coordinates. The x and the y are switched around. So this would be considered the inverse. For equations and functions, again, you do the same thing. The only th you switch x and y. The only thing that may give students a little bit of trouble is where's the y value? Quick reminder that the function name is the same as the y value, so I'd encourage students to replace the function name with the letter y. And then to find the inverse, x and y need to change places. So the function doesn't change, or the equation doesn't change, it's just the letters flip-flop. And then usually you want to solve for y. Usually you want the y alone. So you're going to use your algebra skills here to isolate the y value by moving the half and the 5. The 5 is further away, so we're going to subtract that from both sides. And then to get rid of a fraction next to a variable, you should multiply by the reciprocal. Just be careful here when you multiply by the reciprocal, which is 2, you want to make sure to multiply everything by 2, so we should put this in parentheses. So when we're all done here, we should get either 2 times x minus 5 in parentheses, or you can go ahead and do the distributive property and say 2x minus 10. Since this was called the f of x function, I would encourage students to use the new symbols for the inverse, which hopefully they're familiar with, and that is simply f inverse of x. And I ran out of room on this one, so let's rewrite it. 2x minus 10, f inverse of x. The benefit of using that type of notation is it alerts you to the fact that this is an inverse and it goes with the original f function. So it kind of guides your eye to look for that f function because now we know that those two go together. They are inverses of each other. For graphs, to find the inverse you should switch x and y around, but technically it's a lot easier to simply flip it over the line y equals x. So it's okay for students to grab some coordinates on the actual graph itself and then flip-flop the x and the y's of the coordinates, but know that you could also just do a quick sketch of the line over y equals x. y equals x is a diagonal line that goes through quadrants 1 and 3, and so you can kind of eyeball that and make a quick sketch there. It's obviously going to be more accurate if you use a table, so I'm not a very good drawer and a good eyeballer, so I'm going to go ahead and use a table instead. So I'm just going to grab some of these coordinates from the parabola and I'm going to start way off to the left here at negative 2, 4, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4. So then to do the inverse I would simply graph in such a way that I start with these as my x values and those as my y's because remember an inverse is when x and y switch. And so you'll see that when I'm done graphing that, you'll get a picture of this parabola as if it were flipped or folded over this diagonal line. So that's another way to just sketch it. I know that I'm always going to be more accurate if I use the table. 
So I'm going to graph 4, negative 2 as my first coordinate. And then 1, negative 1. 0, 0 stayed the same. 1, 1 stays the same. And then I'm going to graph 4, 2. And so now I'm going to get basically what looks like kind of a sideways parabola. And so that's what I would have gotten if I would have simply reflected the green parabola over the red line, but I knew I was going to be more accurate by using the table. If students just want to eyeball it for their homework, I'm okay with that. But on a test or a quiz, you'll want to make sure that you're accurate. So when graphing, you can find the inverse by graphing the original graph over the line y equals x. When you're done graphing, something you might want to consider is the inverse a function. And a reminder there to figure that out, you would simply use the vertical line test. So if we look at the green original graph here of the parabola, that parabola is a function, but its inverse is not, because the inverse would not pass the, hor the vertical line test. I already introduced students to the notation for inverses. You keep the name of the function the same, and then you put a negative 1, almost like an exponent, but it, you would say it as f inverse of x. So if you're working with other variables, like let's say that your function is g of x, its inverse then would be g inverse of x. So it looks like you're raising it to the negative 1 power as an exponent, but when you say it, you simply pronounce it as g inverse of x. So now let's put the lesson we're doing today along with lesson 3.7 from yesterday, talking about composition of functions and their inverses and how they relate. If you compose g with f and f with g, and in both cases you get the letter x back, then that proves that f and g are indeed inverses of each other. So to, for an example for that, of plugging, of doing a composition of functions in two directions to get x, let's utilize our function from before when we were doing equations. We had f of x, and then we found its inverse to be f inverse of x to be 2x minus 10. So what I'm going to do is compose those two functions with each other and show you what happens. So I'm going to do f composed with f inverse of x, and I'm going to show that that's equal to composing them in the other direction, and that in both cases we're going to get x back. So on this first one, I'm plugging the inverse into f. So I focus on what f looks like. f looks like 1 half times something plus 5. In that empty space where the variable used to be, I'm going to plug the inverse function, which is 2x minus 10. Now when I get rid of the parentheses here by doing multiplication or the distributive property, a half times 2x is simply going to be 2 over 2x, which is just x. A half times negative 10 is negative 5. Now that I've done the distributive property, the parentheses drop, and then I still have this plus 5 to deal with. x minus 5 plus 5 is simply x. So far so good on that one. Now let's go the other direction. Let's plug f into its inverse. The way that the inverse looks is that it's 2 times something minus 10. In place of the space that I have, I'm going to plug function f. Function f is 1 half x plus 5. So now I'm going to do the distributive property on that. 2 times a half x is going to be 2 over 2x, which is just 1x. 2 times 5 is 10. Because I've done the distributive property, I can drop the parentheses, and then I still have this minus 10 that I need to deal with. The 10 minus the 10 cancels out, so I just get x. So I got what I expected. In both cases, when I composed f with its inverse in both directions, I got x back.